What's going on, everybody? Michael Millerman here again. Thought I would talk to you about Jordan Peterson and his comments against online anonymity. So we pull up this article, and I'm just going to give a few uh, a few seconds here for those of you who click through to join. I am 1776.com, definitely a publication that you should be aware of and having a look at from time to time. They just interviewed Blake Masters. For example, they've interviewed Mike Anton. I've had something published there about Heidegger before, and uh, it's a good, good outlet. I am 1776.com. Here's an article by Jeff Schellenberger. I haven't read it yet. We're reading it together. The Anons Write. And you see here what we have is the anonymity debate in historical perspective. Jordan Peterson posted December 16th the following. I am increasingly convinced that Twitter anonymity is the refuge of scoundrels and fiends. Say it, he says, and stand behind it or hold your tongue. Well, that gave rise to some debate about the status of anonymity, Twitter anonymity. You could say anonymity more broadly or like pseudonymity as well, you know, people who write under some protective cover. But Twitter anonymity, a big question. A lot of the great accounts there are anonymous. First of all, you can uh, certainly post here in the chat if you'd like. It'll come up on screen. Any anonymous accounts that you follow that you like, you don't have to, but uh, something you could do. A lot of the Straussian accounts that I follow that I really like, good sense of humor and uh, smart people discussing good books, they're anonymous. Well, okay, so you have this question. Is anonymity the refuge of scoundrels and fiends, like Jordan Peterson suggested, or not? So here's this article, and let's just go through it together. As I said before, I haven't read it. We're seeing it together uh, for the first time. This recent tweet by the Canadian psychology professor and self-help guru Jordan Peterson attracted heavy criticism from what has become known as the online Anon right. It was only the latest dust-up in an ongoing debate on the right end of the political spectrum over anonymity on digital platforms. Anonymous accounts played a crucial role in the rise to the loosely defined dissident right, and major voices within its orbit, notably the writer and podcaster Bronze Age Pervert, whose Twitter account was suspended recently, have proclaimed the superiority of anonymous writing. However, some fellow travelers have lately emphasized its strategic limitations. Who's he referring to there? We'll see in a moment. These critics of anonymity have suggested that the nascent movement will not come into its own politically unless it is fronted by people who attach their names to their writing. Let's see, who's the fellow traveler who has emphasized its strategic limitations? Adam L. Wanger, Against Anonymity, maybe an article that we'll have a look at next. In an interview with IM1776, essayist and former Trump administration official Michael Anton, who rose to prominence himself with the pseudonymously published essay, The Flight 93 Election, asserted that the right needs people writing under their own name, just to put that veneer of respectability that a certain class of reader needs in order to even open their mind to the argument. Furthermore, anonymity encourages writers to be edgy and want to push it, and you end up saying things that discredit your own side, Michael Anton writes. Similarly, the influential writer and technologist Curtis Yarvin, who also made his name as a pseudonymous blogger, has stated that nothing binds anons to reality, they are, as he puts it, playing tennis without the net. Conversely, to the defenders of anonymity, the danger of writing under one's legal name is that it incentivizes striving for mainstream respectability. As Yarvin, who emerged from behind the veil of anonymity years ago, notes, the publicly known writer faces the opposite temptation from the anon's reflex to provoke. You're always policing yourself. Not only do your readers never really know what you really believe, you never really know yourself. The pseudonymous fiction writer and Twitter personality Zero HP Lovecraft has quipped along the same lines in the past, insinuating that the courage of posting under one's name is an illusion. Let's read that together. Yeah, you're a real brave guy posting under your real name and face about how much you agree with every 
world government and every international corporation. Behind this debate is a tension between two movement goals. On one hand, a continuation of the internet-centric strategy of countercultural provocation, long associated with the sphere, and on the other, pursuing and exercising power. However, while its disagreements have emerged in reaction to the increasingly restrictive information regime established over the course of the Trump era, which found its most drastic culmination in the former president's banishment from all major platforms, uh, controversies about anonymous and pseudonymous writing date back to the emergence of the public internet, and far beyond that, to the origins of the modern world. Definitely a big topic there. We're going to continue this article in just a second. I want to go over and see who's here. Hello to those of you who are watching. No comments yet. Feel free if you want to say anything about the article as I go through it. Let's just return to the article. The questions raised by anonymity involve both platform operators and users. The former must determine whether or how to link user profiles to verifiable legal identities, while the latter must decide how much of their offline lives they're willing to publicize. Isn't it the position of uh, Balaji that anonymity is the future? And hasn't he described all of the ways in which uh, to, how can you put it, like c construct communication systems based on principles of anonymity? Um, well, the question raised by anonymity involves platform operators and users. So how do platform operators verify legal identities and at the same time allow the user to decide how much they want to publicize? The initial rise of social media prompted concerns about oversharing and the overexposure of our everyday lives to the public gaze. On the other hand, the opposite worry also emerged. The inability to link the content on a particular account to any real life person might circumvent standard modes of accountability. And that sounds like what Peterson was worried about way up here when he wrote, say it and stand behind it or hold your tongue. Otherwise, you are taking the refuge of scoundrels and fiends. The celebration of anonymity has generally proceeded out of the cyber libertarian creed of internet freedom, as memorably formulated in John Perry Barlow's 1996 Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace. The promise of the internet as a newly and uniquely free space entailed the possibility of shedding pre-existing identities and forging new malleable digital ones. By untethering online profiles from legal identities, many assumed users could free themselves from arbitrary restrictions and expand the frontiers of free expression. No surprise then that the all anonymous platform 4chan, well before its association with the alt-right, gave rise to the most notable cyber libertarian political movement to date, aptly named Anonymous. It's checking in. Hello, those of you who are here, I see as you know, I'm not doing this through YouTube, so I have to click over here to see how many people are around. Nice to see everybody, so to speak. Good to be with you. Feel free to comment anytime if you'd like. It's surprising in retrospect that a soft version of cyber libertarianism once prevailed among liberals as well as many in the tech elite. Academic leftists even praised Anonymous during its initial period of infamy. All this changed, of course, in the wake of Trump's 2016 presidential victory when panic over alleged risks like misinformation and online radicalization inaugurated a new censorious consensus among media gatekeepers, liberal politicians, and their allies among tech CEOs. And as you probably know, this is a topic that Glenn Greenwald does a great job covering. The crackdown found a new rationale amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, during which the risk of viral misinformation became conflated with the threat of literal viral spread. Anonymity and pseudonymity obviously pose challenges for informational contact tracing. Those of you who are just watching, we're reading this article from IM 1776 about the online anonymous right and Jordan Peterson's claim that they are taking the refuge of scoundrels and fiends when they write anonymously. This evolving situation is a repetition of earlier historical developments. The author writes, as has often been remarked, the invention of the printing press more than 500 years ago challenged church and state authorities' monopoly on textual production and dissemination in a manner that anticipated the internet's multiplication of information channels. Print enabled an unprecedented proliferation of text and posed new regulatory challenges. One approach many rulers took was to limit the distribution of licenses for the operation of printing presses. Another was to require state censors' approval for all books published, Amidst this restrictive regime, as in the current panorama, 
heretics and dissenters turn to anonymous and pseudonymous publications. And by the way, you probably know, or if you don't, I'm going to tell you that there's a scholar of the history of political philosophy named Leo Strauss, who wrote about, quote, persecution in the art of writing in a way that's probably not completely irrelevant to this issue. In other words, that is relevant to this issue. In his 1969 essay, What is an Author? Michael Foucault, it's Michelle, isn't it? Foucault argues that the emergence of a modern conception of authorship is only comprehensible in light of this struggle for control over the proliferation of text unleashed by new technology in the centuries after Gutenberg. In earlier ages, he notes, the authors whose names were conjoined with texts were typically mythical, sacralized, and sacralizing figures. The attachment of a name to a text, whether Homer, Moses, or Hermes Trismegistus, excuse me, Trismegistus, uh, was a way of bestowing it with a transcendental legitimacy rather than an attempt to accurately identify the individual responsible for its composition. This sensibility explains the prevalence of pseudepigrapha or falsely attributed texts in the ancient and medieval worlds. The purpose of authorial attribution was for the most part not to accurately link a text to its real author, but to establish its authoritative status. A continuation of this approach can be found in the online proliferation of dubiously attributed inspirational quotations. You see a lot of those where some bit of trite pablum is endowed with the gravitas of a Gandhi or a Martin Luther King, or what I hate to see, Plato or Aristotle. In the Renaissance, scholars became preoccupied with debunking false attributions and reliable attributions of authorship. This enterprise could have major political implications as Lorenzo Valla's exposure of the donation of Constantine as a forgery. Only in what Marshall McLuhan, continuing, called the Gutenberg Galaxy, then did authorship become a way to assign a text to a particular legal identity. The concern with truthful identifications of authorship in the early modern period responded to shifts in power relations brought about by printing, which challenged the regulation of textual production and circulation. The institution of authorship, argues Foucault, was subsequent to what one might call penal appropriation. Texts, books, and discourses really began to have authors to the extent that authors became subject to punishment. That is, to the extent that discourses could be transgressive. The demand that texts have authors ensures state oversight of their content. Maybe you can say what you think about that claim. The implications of, and by the way, once again, we're reading this im1776.com article about the online anonymous right uh, because of Jordan Peterson's tweet way up here. I'm increasingly convinced that Twitter anonymity is the refuge of scoundrels and fiends. Say it and stand behind it or hold your tongue. You see thousands of replies. Definitely a big topic. Let's go back down here. The implications of the author function go beyond the regulatory demands of the modern state. The identification of a text with an individual producer and owner also serves to circumscribe a text's meaning. As Foucault puts it, the author is the principle of thrift in the proliferation of meaning. He allows a limitation of the cancerous and dangerous proliferation of significations. That is, the assumption that a text has a determinate fixed meaning is linked to the idea that it emerges from the intentions of a particular author. This argument has become even more intuitive in the internet age. Scrolling our timelines today, we're all accustomed to constantly finding ourselves forced to ask questions like, is this post for real or just a troll? Is this a parody account or the real thing? Not coincidentally, platforms like 4chan, which incubated Anonymous, were at the forefront of the destabilization of meaning online. Anonymity enabled not only the violation of taboos, but the inducement of a bewildering undecidability of the sort Foucault associates with avant-garde literary experiments. The emergence of the folk postmodern sensibility of Chan culture was directly linked to the sidelining of named authorship. For postmodern thinkers, the evanescence of the author function was a necessary precondition of the liberation of text from the straitjacket of meaning, the project of much of 20th century avant-garde literature. Hence, Foucault begins his essay with a line from the modernist writer Samuel Beckett, what difference does it make who's speaking? But the implications of this liberation from authorship and meaning were political as well as aesthetic, since the bourgeois state's power was based on its ability to regulate what it was possible to say and think. Crackdowns on internet speech remind us this is still the case. A lot of Twitter accounts in the last little while, as I'm sure you know, especially since Jack left Twitter, have disappeared. Good accounts. 
And there are certainly other cases of high profile, important figures who have been yanked off Twitter and YouTube. For example, Alexander Dugan, who was pulled off YouTube last year, unfortunately. Um, but we can't really include him in this argument because he wasn't doing his work anonymously. The dissonant rights ongoing debate over anonymity, therefore, speaks to a deeper uncertainty about the nature and aims of that somewhat nebulous movement, according to this author. Is it fundamentally an avant-garde project that aims to disrupt the underlying mechanisms that enable the regime to regulate speech and meaning? By the way, those of you who are here, who are listening to this, who find this interesting, maybe you want to answer it in the chat or in the comments, your perspective on this question. Is the dissident right fundamentally an avant-garde project that aims to disrupt the underlying mechanisms that enable the regime to regulate speech and meaning? If so, the strategies of anonymity that have thrived on the open web in the past few decades look increasingly imperiled, which is why a shift towards blockchain-based crypto anarchist projects offers the obvious path forward. The arguments against anonymity point in the opposite direction, suggesting that the aim is to channel wild energies unleashed on the internet towards conventional electoral aims without challenging the function of the information system and the values they tacitly shape. So that would be an argument for abandoning anonymity for the sake of conventional electoral aims. These disagreements across this ideological constellation, however, do not render these two factions fundamentally incompatible. The assumption that politics is downstream from culture, which has guided many on the right in the past two decades, personally, I think that we should see culture as downstream from philosophy and move our arguments about politics from culture to philosophy. But, you know, that represents my uh, inclinations there. The assumption that politics is downstream from culture, which has guided many on the right in the past two decades, implies that cultural activities pave the way for political projects proper. As Yarvin has put it, all revolutions begin as a fundamentally aesthetic break. I got to say here, as a proponent of Leo Strauss's history of political philosophy, we should consider that revolutions begin not as an aesthetic break, but as a philosophical break. Nevertheless, the growing anxiety about anonymity Oops, yeah, you see this on screen, I hope. Nevertheless, the growing anxiety about anonymity, among other things, suggests a concern about cultural and aesthetic tactics becoming an end in themselves. Pretty interesting. Jeff Schollenberger is a writer and academic. He blogs at OutsiderTheory.com. So we've been reading The Anons Right by Jeff Schollenberger. You should definitely comment on the article. Uh, let him know that you read it and enjoyed it, if you did. And certainly in the comments here, in the chat, or wherever you'd like, let me know what you think about these claims. Is there a disagreement on the right about whether it should aim at institutional legitimacy and whether anonymity is incompatible with that or whether it aims at undermining the current uh, information system and values and therefore anonymity is a tool for that? Okay, so that was that article. It would be interesting actually to go through some of these replies as well, potentially, but the article linked to this against anonymity piece by Adam L. Wanger and while we're here, we might as well just go over it. For some of you, this could be uh, this could be decent. Whoops. How do I? Can I see your comments without moving that thing? Hmm. Sorry, just give me a second. Okay, I see some comments here, so thank you for those of you commenting. I don't think we have privacy at all. Everything we've ever posted is compiled, plus geolocation, our bank accounts, etc. Yeah, do we have any privacy? What about the crypto alternatives? Can those ensure some measure of, of, uh, of privacy? Uh, what else do we have here? Algorithms of social media platforms, which create echo chambers and confirmation biases en masse. What you search for is what comes in your feeds and confirms your worldview. Angry people click, active measures, reflective conditioning, etc. So a bunch of things here that you can look at in the comments. Whoops. There we go. Now we're going to go back over to this against anonymity. So again, just those of you who are tuning in, we'd started with reading the IM 1776 article about the online anonymous dissident right. It linked to this against anonymity. So I just kind of want to go through this with you now. It is time for political resistance in our own names. Editors note, the following piece does not necessarily reflect the opinions or beliefs of the editors of the American mind. We publish many items by pseudonymous authors and understand the practical necessity and value of maintaining anonymity. By the way, you guys know there are many things that if you don't say anonymously can cost you your reputation, 
your job, not because you're crazy and what you said is crazy, but because we're in an atmosphere that does not have a high level of tolerance for, uh, how could you put it, opinions that are not, strictly speaking, orthodox. There's a long respected tradition of using pseudonyms in writing about politics. Nonetheless, the author makes strong points that we find worthy of consideration. That's why the American mind is a great place. Look, they have their own position, and yet they're going to engage with uh, points that are worthy of consideration, and we are going to do so as well. I participate in a number of online politically oriented group chats, which include professors, military men, stay-at-home parents, lawyers, and entrepreneurs, the author writes. The membership of these chats varies from a few dozen to hundreds of people, and I have met almost none of them in person. These groups are all composed of people who are deeply troubled by the direction of America over the last 20 years. By the way, some of you watching this, listening to me now or later, also are aware of uh, online chat groups, which include people from all walks of life who are deeply troubled by the direction of America over the last 20 years. Common topics of discussion range from the ideological groupthink that defines the culture of higher education and the political leveraging of COVID-19 to expand state power to the elite fixation on racial grievance and the aggressions of the LGBTQIA plus lobby. Those who take part are anxious and angry at America's dominant institutions, which have had a malign influence on the way people live, work, raise children, and are cared for when sick. These conversations help us to piece together a more informed, broader perspective on what's happening in America establishing communication across boundaries that sometimes aren't crossed in everyday life. Nurses tell teachers what is happening in the hospitals and teachers tell entrepreneurs what is happening in the administration of public schools. These groups grow organically. One trusted member mentions to the group a friend or acquaintance who would be a sympathetic or useful addition to the chat. With the permission of the group, that member then invites their trusted friend to join. This presumption of trust and confidentiality is critical in these chats. Most members believe that openly expressing opposition to the equity-oriented racialized ideology taking over American institutions, that's what I called that orthodoxy, could cost them whether professionally, personally, or financially. But if there is any single theme that dominates these dialogues, it is what can we do? What strategies can private citizens use to take back our political agency and our rights? These are hard questions to answer, especially when the forms that effective resistance can take are narrowed considerably when one worries that the personal risks that attend resistance are too high to bear. In short, here's the problem. People want to fight, but they want to fight anonymously or pseudonymously. There's much talk of anonymous letters, of secret leaking of internal workplace communications to journalists who might be willing to publish them. These aren't bad ideas, but they are necessarily limited in their potential impact. Just as an anonymous accusation carries less weight than one where the accuser puts his name and face behind it, covert and anonymous forms of political opposition are less powerful than actions undertaken by people who refuse to conceal their identities. That's in line with Jordan Peterson's quote, uh, say it and stand behind it without anonymity. This is one of the many reasons it is hard to muster any respect for the masked thugs in Antifa, and our fortunes in the unfolding cultural conflict will be partly dependent on our willingness to speak boldly in our own voices, to use our own names openly and honestly. The left loves to talk about speaking truth to power, reflecting its fantasies of being the downtrodden little guy punching up at a callous elite that disdains him. By the way, guys, just a reminder here, I'm reading AmericanMind.org against anonymity because our topic here is responses to Peterson's quote about Twitter anonymity. And the article we were looking at in im1776.com referred to this article. I also want to say you should definitely feel free to be making comments in the chat. Yeah, and of course, like this video and subscribe to the channel. Let's go back here. The left loves to talk about speaking truth to power, reflecting its fantasies of being the downtrodden little guy punching up at a callous elite that disdains him. But in today's America, the left cannot genuinely speak truth to power. Given that left ideology dominates the governance of every single institution of national life, I wonder what Jason Stanley 
thinks about that. The military, Hollywood, administrative government, education, the medical establishment, publishing. The left embodies political power in America. They can't speak truth to power because they themselves are the power to which the truth would need to be spoken. Speaking truth to power implies some real risk of punishment from the powerful people to whom the criticism is directed. But the last few years have demonstrated that even violent left activists operate with almost total impunity. Again, a point that Glenn Greenwald, among others, has made much of. Not only were the BLM rioters, the Antifa terrorists in Portland, and the Capitol protesters against Brett Kavanaugh not punished for their supposed resistance to power, their message aligned with and advanced the objectives of the powerful. Nevertheless, speaking truth to power is a potent form of political resistance, not because it serves to inform the powerful, but because it sets a positive example for others who might feel too timid to speak up. When people hear a dangerous truth that is harshly critical of powerful entities who could inflict significant harm upon the truth tellers, listeners not only admire the bravery of the truth teller, they're more likely to believe that what the dissenter says is actually true. Why would the speaker incur such risks to speak a falsehood? This kind of truth telling, which the ancients sometimes called Parisia, changes the way the broader public understands their reality. Over time, Parisia modifies the dynamics of the battle behind the powerful and those who are subjected to that power. Authoritarian statism, the author continues, is rapidly rising in our nation, which looks more like oligarchy than democracy. The members of the encrypted chats to which I belong, which she discussed earlier in the article, find nearly universal agreement on this basic insight, and they want to fight, they want to resist, and they want to push back. But far too many of them are still unwilling to do so openly. They will resist only up to the point at which it might cost them something. A fractured relationship with a family member, a lost promotion at work, a lack of respect from one's colleagues, or a seat at dinner parties with influential people. They will not sacrifice these things yet. The reluctant dissenters, the ones who might be said to comprise a silent majority, are betting on Ketman, the idea that one can conform to the rigid ideological demands of empowered ideologies and institutions while privately maintaining their dignity and their heartfelt opposition to those in power. But Ketman is a form of quietism, and while it is better to have people on your side than against you, as long as they're unwilling to undertake forms of resistance that would incur meaningful risk, the more potent forms of resistance, then they are of limited use to our efforts. We must, the author continues, Persuade the reluctant dissenters to accept the risks that come from open opposition. The best way is to give up your own anonymity. Model the act of Parisia and be an example. This means giving up your Twitter handle of DeSantis or Bus24 or MAGA in FLA 1987. My social media accounts are under my own name, Adam L. Wanger. That's the author of this piece. This exposes me to some risks, but it also keeps me honest. It makes me seriously consider everything I post and whether I believe it is true. Once again, reflecting the ethos represented by Jordan Peterson's Twitter post from December 16th. There is accountability. I was reminded of this recently when an anonymous hate speech complaint was lodged against me at my university for something I said on social media. Being, a, being an example of someone who's willing to incur risk for speaking the truth also demands that you put your name on that anonymous critique of the mandated diversity and inclusion training that you were planning to email to your coworkers. So no hiding behind anonymity. Abandoning your anonymity isn't a demonstration of fearlessness. Okay, fearlessness. It's not that you suddenly don't fear. You don't have to be fearless. In fact, you probably would be silly to be. The stakes are high. And serious displays of resistance or non-compliance probably will be punished. You are right to be afraid because the left works hard to instill fear. You just need to be brave enough to act despite your fears. Until we are willing to do so to act with full knowledge of the potential consequences, things simply haven't gotten bad enough. Which means that things will continue to get worse. Okay, Until we are willing to face our fears, according to the author and to speak truth to power, to speak truthfully against uh, corrupt power uh, in our own names, things will continue to get worse. Eventually, prospects for human flourishing will be so diminished that everyday people will be forced into open opposition. But the longer such, whoops, sorry, the longer such action is delayed, 
the harder it will be to break the left's grip on power. In his remarkably prescient 2010 book, The Ruling Class, Angelo Codevilla reminds us that Machiavelli compares serious political diseases to the Aetolian fevers, easy to treat early on when they're difficult to discern, but virtually untreatable by the time they become obvious. Serious political resistance, like serious medical intervention, always hurts. But the earlier that interventions are made, the more quickly the patient is rehabilitated. If we are to bring our nation back to health, we will eventually have to submit to the knife. The sooner, the better. That was Adam L. Wanger, a professor, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, is a professor of English and director of the graduate program in rhetoric and composition at the University of Houston. And once again, for those of you who are just joining, this was against anonymity. It's time for political resistance in our own names. And the reason we were reading that is because it was referred to in an I am 1776 article about this tweet by Peterson. I am increasingly convinced that Twitter anonymity is the refuge of scoundrels and fiends. Say it and stand behind it or hold your tongue. There's a debate to be had there. And I hope that you can make some uh, comments on this video or in the chat to let me know what you think is the right uh, position on anonymity, given those two articles that we just read. And here, I'm gonna pull up the chat. And what do we see going on? in the chat. So I don't jive with Peterson's bitter vibe, but he's resonating. Try coming from a positive place. Okay, so one thing is his vibe, whether it's positive or bitter, but another is the argument. Is he right or not about anonymity and uh, speaking truly in public? It sounds like a dichotomy, Nicholas writes, between authenticity and profilicity. Why don't political thinkers ever take into consideration the people who man the institutions. To me, the political paradigms are irrelevant when lobbyism exists and every cabinet has Exxon Pfizer employee, writes Jill Beat is back. It's interesting too in the comment in the commenters, there's some people writing anonymously, some people under their own names. So it is legitimately a question. Uh, what do you what do you think about the anonymous online right versus speaking in your own name? Is there a place in that movement and more generally in public speech for both anonymity and uh, you know actual identity. So we've been just reading some articles about this. I am increasingly convinced that Twitter anonymity is the refuge of scoundrels and fiends. Say it and stand behind it or hold your tongue. By the way, I'm gonna read some of these responses because I think it's kind of interesting to do with you. But I wanna say that even though there are detractors of Peterson, I've been reading his book for the first, uh, well, I read it for the first time, the first 12 rules for life just a little while ago, and I'm rereading it for something that I plan to write about it. And it's good. I recommend it. It's, uh, I don't have a bad word to say about his book. And yet, I'm not necessarily sure about this position that he's taken on Twitter anonymity. So let's just read some of these comments. And again, if you don't mind, you know, like this video if you're into it. Subscribe to the channel if you want. Millermanschool.com if you want to check out my courses. Are you in favor, asks Angelo Isidoru, of forcing users to use their real names? I imagine it would prevent a significant amount of slander and overall drivel. Guys, do any of you know somebody who has been canceled, fired, threatened, attacked, uh, who's paid a price because they voiced not a crazy opinion? They weren't like a Unabomber or something like that. They just broke with the orthodoxy slightly and had to pay a penalty for that. Anonymity protects people who need protection to a certain extent, who can't just lay it all down on the line because the uh, the woke uh, guillotine is going to come for their neck if they take a single step out of line. Anonymity is important. It's important to protect. It's important to understand. And yet, maybe not in all cases, maybe not for all reasons. So let's keep going on to these uh, responses to Peterson's quote about Twitter anonymity. Need a social media with no anonymous account will immediately shift if uh, ever such a thing came up. Well, let's see some of the big responses here. I agree to a degree. Laugh, you loser. Jim, Tom, 6,025.06. I agree to a degree. There are people that have an opinion, but if they say it and lose their jobs, then they have nothing. Therefore, anonymity is their only option. Isn't that the case? Okay, aren't there people who will lose their jobs and really genuinely have the rug pulled out from under their feet if they say what they think in the wrong company. You have to be careful. And again, I'm not talking about anything outrageous. 
Uh, okay. Well, we're not going to go through all of this. I know some of my, some of the anonymous people that I follow had some great responses to Peterson, and some of them were pretty uh, blistering. All right, Peterson. I hope that you get a chance to make some comment here, your view on uh, on all of that and what we were looking at together. Uh, where is it here? Where we started our live stream was with uh, im1776.com. You should check it out. There are other articles here. Interview with Blake Masters, uh, Beauty, A World After Liberalism. But we were looking at this one right here, Jeff Schellenberger, that anonymous, uh, the right of anonymity and the anonymous right. Would love to know what you think about all of that, guys. Thanks for spending your time here. I hope you found this interesting and helpful. Please like, subscribe, share, all the usual things. And uh, if you ever want to take a look at the teaching I do in a more formal setting, millermanschool.com is where my courses are at the moment. All right, anonymity, online anonymity versus uh, say it and stand behind it or hold your tongue. Do comment, say what you think. You can use your own name. You can write it honestly. It's all good to me. Thanks, guys. See you in the next video. Bye.